Hello, everyone. So we are, again, simplifying trig expressions here. We're going to start in 5.1. In these simplifying trig expressions, basically what we're going to be doing is taking some um, different variations of trig expressions and deciding can we factor them, can we simplify them in any way, if we can, how can we simplify them, and again, going back to using some of your identities. So I don't have a sheet right next to me right now, but I gave it to you last semester. It's also going to be linked in the website and on Google Classroom. Uh, but the big sheet of all the different trig identities that we talked about all in um, chapter four from last semester. Okay, so the first example I want to use, oops, I actually don't think that was a, that's a marker. That's not a dry erase marker, oops. Um, the first one I want to do with you is sine x cosine x squared minus sine x. So sine x cosine squared x minus sine x. So while we are, will be simplifying this one, I want to show you a little thing off to the side. Let's say I had 5x squared minus 25. And I told you, I want you to factor out the greatest common factor. Or in some terms, we call this factoring out a monomial um, or a common monomial. So basically here, we have to look at 5x squared and 25 and say, what is the greatest common factor between the two of those things? So considering there's only an x in the first term, not an x in the second term, then I have to look at my numbers and start with these constants. So between 5 and 25, the greatest common factor that goes into both of those would be 5. Okay, so I could actually factor out a 5. When we factor something out, it's the same thing as dividing each of the terms by said factor. So dividing 5x squared by 5, we're left with x squared. Dividing negative 25 by 5, we're left with negative Five. Okay, and that would be the, um, in this case, one of my biggest tools to help me factor that um, little expression out. We, went, we always like to go straight to factoring out greatest common factor because then with what's left, I can say, all right, now can I factor this any further? If not, you set equal to zero and solve. So while we can do that with actual numbers, we can also do that with trig terms. So when I'm looking at this, um, it strikes me that I want to use greatest common factor because of the fact that I see I have a sine and a sine term. If I could pull out those sine terms, I'm thinking that I'm going to have a lot better chances of being able to simplify this down. So I want to factor out a sine x. When you factor that out again, it's like dividing each term by said factor. Okay, so this is sine x cosine squared x divided by sine x. Sines cancel to leave you with just cosine squared x. Negative sine divided by sine is negative 1. And now some of you might be thinking like, ooh, that looks like a trick identity, right? And, and, and you might not be thinking that, that's okay. But inside here, if I have a cosine squared and a 1, I'm likely headed towards a trig identity. But I want to remind you, the trig identity that we're thinking of is sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. So the one that we're currently kind of thinking about is when cosine and 1 are on the same side of the equal sign, meaning I need to get cosine over to this side. That gives me sine squared x equals 1 minus cosine squared. X. But there's a small problem here. This identity tells me that my one is positive and my cosine is negative. What I currently have is a positive cosine and a negative one. I can still use this identity, but what I have to do is to get what I have to look like my identity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this entire thing um, by negative one. Okay, if I multiply this whole thing by negative one, we're going to then get negative 
side, not squared x, sorry, we are not with squares yet. I'm going to get negative sine multiplied by negative cosine squared, positive one. Okay, so now this is looking a little bit more like something that I can use. Positive one, negative cosine, positive one, negative cosine. I can replace this entire thing with sine squared x, giving me negative sine times positive sine squared. When we have a negative times a positive, it becomes negative sine times sine squared. Again, adding those exponents, giving me sine negative sine cubed. Okay, so the main, the main heart, like I'd say the hardest part of this is being able to identify one that you can factor out a sign, two then being able to see, well, I can use a Pythagorean identity. I just have to alter this before I can go ahead and use that. All right, moving on. Um, looking at time. Okay, I'm gonna do one more of that one. I think that one's a little bit tricky, so we're gonna try one more if we have enough time. If you've got that one, you're okay. You can go ahead and skip forward to the next example. If you would like to see another example of that one, go ahead and stay on this um, portion of the video and don't skip ahead. All right, I want you to simplify now cosine squared x, cosecant x minus cosecant. So again, the reason that I'm seeing I want to use greatest common factor here is I have both a cosecant in my first term and a cosecant in my second term. When I'm having that same term that I know I could factor out very easily, my best bet is to bring that out before I start working with any of the rest of it. So I'm going to factor out cosecant again, the same thing as dividing each term by said factor. This leaves me with cosine squared x minus 1. Again, factoring out cosecant leaves me with none here. Cosecant divided by cosecant, this is with that 1. So again, here's my same problem. I did an awesome job factoring out my cosecant, but I'm left now with positive cosine squared minus 1. Let's go back to the fact that this was sine squared x equals one minus cosine squared. I have to, again, go ahead and multiply this by a negative one. Divide by negative one, multiply by one, whatever you wanna do. Either way, this leaves you with negative cosecant times negative cosine squared plus one. Now that I have a negative cosine and a positive one, I can go ahead and say, all right, well, this whole thing can be replaced with sine squared, leaving me with negative cosecant times sine squared. Now, remember, we are trying to simplify these as much as we possibly can. So this is not okay. I can't leave these two things just multiplied together. Why can't I? I know that cosecant and sine are reciprocal, reciprocal identities of one another. Okay, they they're, are each other's reciprocal functions. Being so, we have to know that these just can't get smushed together and we call it good. We know that sine actually equals, um, actually I wanna write it this way instead, that cosecant, I wanna write that, equals one over sine. Knowing that cosecant equals one over sine, I'm going to replace cosecant with one over sine multiplied by sine squared. This being so, cancels out my denominator and cancels out one of my exponents, bringing me down to just a negative sine to the first. And that would be as far as I can simplify that one down. All right, switching gears a tiny bit, I wanna show you how you can factor in some other ways. 
Um, so let me remind you before we do this example of sine squared minus one. If I had, let's say, x squared minus nine. x squared minus nine. So we have a specific formula kind of for factoring these. This is called the difference of squares. So what happens is this is a perfect square and this is a perfect square, okay? x squared is a perfect square. Nine, I could take the square root of nine and I get three. So what happens is we want to be able to have our first term subtracted and added by some by the square root of our last term. Okay, so you take square root of the first term, subtract and add, square root of your last term. So the square root of nine is three. So the way that this would factor out would be x plus three and x minus three. So it's really truthfully, really simple thought right there. So what's any different with this one then? I want to ask you, is sine squared a perfect square? Yes, I could take the square root of that. I would just get sine. Is 1 a perfect square? Take the square root of 1, and you just get 1. We're negating the fact that this is a negative, right? Um, our formula here, this, this way of factoring, factors in the fact that this is a negative um, number there. So just like we did with the actual numbers, we are going to take the square root of the first term, which is sine, subtracted and added to the square root of the last term. Square root of the last term is just one. So we get sine x plus one and sine x minus one. Okay, so again, same kind of little easier thought there. Other ways to factor. Um, let's do cosine squared x plus 2 cosine minus 3. All right. So what I want to remind you of is this is like screaming a trinomial that I can factor. Okay. Trinomials that you can factor. They're really easy when they have no constant, um, no leading coefficient here. Um, and then I have a squared, my middle term, my last term that has no variable or trig function on it. This is going to be very similar to its, let's write this just identical to, the, I'm going to write one that's just the same as this one, but with x's instead of cosines. All right, so when we factor trinomials, the method is we're going to get two binomials and because we have an x as our um, variable here, it'll always be an x in the front of those two binomials. The way we get the sign in the last um, term is two numbers that multiply to negative three but add to two. Okay, so we want to think of factors of three are one and three. So out of one and three, which one needs to be negative so that we get a positive two when we add, but a negative three when we multiply. So it's obviously gonna have to be a negative one because negative one times three still gives me negative three, but negative one plus three is going to give me that positive two. So we write in either order, um, negative one and a positive three. So what does this look like if we're using trig instead? It literally looks exactly the same. So again, I use a very similar thought process over here. Our kind of um, variable, which here is a trig function. So we write cosine x in the beginning of each of these. How we again get this last part is by taking numbers that multiply to negative three and add to two. We found out that that was negative one and positive three. So one of the biggest thought processes here is that you can treat trig functions again like you treat any other function or expression that you've dealt with in math. While we have these tools to be able to make substitutions and different ways that we can simplify with trig functions using those identities, the whole process of being able to factor them um, and bring out a, their common term, 
or maybe be able to add them together in just the same as when we just have variables within them. Um, one last example that adds in, it's still factoring, but adds in a little bit of a twist. Okay, so with this one, we are going to do cosecant squared minus cotangent minus three. All right, so I told you I wanted you to factor with this one. And again, it's blaringly obvious that I want to factor this because of the fact that I have a squared, a, no, a non-squared just to a first power term and then just a constant term. Um, but the issue here is, is you have to have this term the same as this one. And I currently have a cosecant and a cotangent. But luckily, I remember that when I have squared functions, I could use Pythagorean identities. One awesome Pythagorean identity that will be the biggest help to us is knowing that cosecant squared equals one plus cotangent squared. Okay, this is a Pythagorean identity. Knowing this, I can replace my cosecant squared with one plus cotangent squared, follow that up with my minus cotangent minus three. Again, just like any other function, I can add like terms. Um, so my like terms here are one and negative three, leaving me with cotangent squared minus cotangent minus two, because one plus negative three is just negative two. And again, I cannot add cotangent squared and negative cotangent together yet, or at all, ever, because one is a squared and one is not. So they are not like terms. Now, at this point, I want to be able to factor. So just like I did before, cotangent is my function. So I have cotangent out in front. My last two terms here are going to come from two numbers that multiply to negative two, add to negative one. Obviously, factors of two are one and two. So out of those, which one needs to be negative to add to negative one? If I have one plus negative two, I get negative one. One times negative two, I get negative two. So it's a plus one and a minus two. All right, that is good for 5.1. There's gonna be an honors um, portion of this coming. So not all of 5.1 is all regular. There is an honors portion going to come from this.